Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of the glenohumeral joint, and we're going to talk about some of the intrinsic ligaments that stabilize the joint. But before we do that, let's again review a little bit of the basic anatomy here in this image. So this is, of course, the scapula over here. Now, is this an anterior or posterior view? Well, this has to be anterior for a couple of reasons. One, we don't see a scapular spine. Scapular spine is only visible on the posterior side, and it divides the posterior side really into the infraspinous fossa, which would be down here on the other side, and then we'd see a little bit of the supraspinous fossa uh, superiorly. We don't see the spine, and so all we see is this large basin here, which pretty much occupies the entire half of the scapula. This would be the subscapular fossa, so that's the anterior view. The second way we know this is these two projections right here. This one over here is the acromion, or acromial process. This one is a coracoid process, and remember the coracoid process is more anterior. The acromial process is a little bit more posterior. So again, two ways of knowing that this is an anterior view. Now here's the humerus right here, and the head of the humerus would be roughly right here. And remember that the head of the humerus is very large, and it fits into a very small concave glenoid fossa, also called the glenoid cavity. And this entire thing right here is really just basically the, the joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint. But there's a lot of ligaments here that we need to identify. So let's go through this. One, we've got the transverse humeral ligament. That's right here. We talked about that in the previous video. It's a ligament that spans between the greater tubercle of the humerus to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. And remember, right between the two tubercles is the intertubercular groove. Remember that the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii actually runs up that groove, and it'll actually go underneath the transverse humeral ligament. Okay? And the, the tendon would actually curve around here and, and originate off of the superglenoid tubercle of the glenoid fossa, which would be roughly right here. Okay? So this is the tendon of long head of biceps. It goes underneath the transverse humeral ligament. Also notice there's a synovial sheath, which we mentioned previously, that wraps around that tendon as it goes underneath the transverse humeral ligament. Over here we have the coracohumeral ligament. This goes between the humerus over to the coracoid process over here. So this is the coracohumeral ligament. We also see down here a redundant capsule. Now, remember that in the uh, glenohumeral joint, inferiorly, there's an axillary pouch. And it's a region of loose joint capsule to allow for some slack. So that way, when the, sh when the shoulder becomes abducted, so you raise your arm up here, if this were tight, it would restrict the range of motion and possibly compress some of the structures in here. So by having this loose, it allows for some slack or some lax. And so when you abduct your arm especially, or your shoulder joint and move your arm up, then this allows for some extra movement and increased range of motion. So it's loose down here. Now internally, this would be the axillary pouch. But externally, the part of the capsule is termed the redundant capsule. Now, there's a few ligaments right here that are glenohumeral ligaments. Okay? We're going to group them collectively. This is the first intrinsic ligament that we're going to see. These are three fibrous bands found only on the internal aspect of the joint capsule. Now, this is just an artist's rendition. This would not be as clean as we see it right here. Okay? In fact, we'd actually need to cut open the joint capsule and look inside to see these. But this is roughly where they'd be. And they all radiate laterally from the superglenoid tubercle, which remember is right about here on the top of the glenoid fossa, which also happens to be the origin of the tendon of the long hand of the biceps, brachii. But they all originate laterally from that and project outward, and they project into three separate bands. There's a superior glenohumeral ligament, a middle glenohumeral ligament, and an inferior glenohumeral ligament. And we'll take a better look at them on the next slide, but it suffices to say right now that they strengthen the anterior capsule of the glenohumeral joint. So they're on the anterior part of the capsule, but you can't see them externally. You have to cut this open. So what they've done here, let me explain what this picture is. This is a posterior view. Okay, So they've basically removed the entire posterior part of the joint capsule. And you're looking into the capsule right here, 
and this right here is the inside part of the anterior capsule, okay? Because this is a posterior view. They took off the posterior cover. You go inside the capsule, and this is the internal or inside part of the anterior capsule. And when you look at these ligaments, they actually form kind of a Z shape, okay? So here is actually the superglenoid tubercle right here, and you can see that they all originate from that. So this one is the superior glenohumeral ligament. It kind of just goes directly laterally. Then there's the middle glenohumeral ligament, which goes laterally and inferiorly. And then there's the inferior one, which directly goes inferior at first, and then kind of goes laterally like this. And so the way to think about it is it kind of forms a Z, a zigzag like that. So you have the superior glenohumeral ligament, the middle one, which goes diagonally downward and laterally, and then the inferior one. And so these three, again, you could only see on the internal aspect of the capsule, but they're on the anterior side of the capsule, and they strengthen the capsule anteriorly. So hopefully that makes sense. That's our first intrinsic ligament, or I should say set of intrinsic ligaments. The second one, which you've, we've already talked about to some extent, is the transverse humeral ligament, sometimes it's called the transverse ligament. This one is a ligament that spans across the two tubercles of the humerus on the anterior side, so from the greater tubercle laterally to the medial, lesser tubercle. And it basically just goes over the intertubercular groove. Now this intertubercular groove, as we've talked about, is also called an intertubercular sulcus, or sometimes called the bicipital groove. Why would it be called a bicipital groove? Because through that groove is the biceps brachii tendon, that is the long head. So biceps, bicipital groove, that's where this name comes from. Um, usually I'll just call it intertubercular groove. But because this transverse humeral ligament goes over the intertubercular groove, it basically creates a canal in here. And this canal is aptly named the intertubercular canal. And through that canal is where the long head of the biceps brachii tendon goes through. Notice here it's still wrapped around that synovial sheath, but both of them are underneath that ligament going through the intertubercular canal. Okay. And what this transverse ligament really does, as you might expect, is it maintains the position of that tendon in the bicipital groove or in the intertubercular groove and the synovial sheath. If this ligament wasn't there, this tendon would just be flopping around. How would you get a tendon to stay here if it's going to go up and then curve around and originate off of this uh, superglenoid tuber tubercle? Well, if you didn't have anything to hold it there, it would just kind of go like this. But having it go underneath this ligament right here forces it to stay attached to the humerus and then it curves over and originates off of that superglenoid tubercle. So maintaining the position of that long head of the biceps brachii tendon right there. That's the second intrinsic ligament. Now the third intrinsic ligament is the coracohumeral ligament. This ligament extends from the base of the coracoid process, which is kind of right in here. We can't see where it's originated from, but it's basically behind this. And then it extends to the anatomical neck of the humerus. Remember, surgical neck is down here. Anatomical neck is really right where um, it intersects with the head of the humerus. So this is the anatomical neck. But this is the coracohumeral ligament. And this functions to strengthen the superior part of the glenohumeral capsule. So while those, uh, cap those glenohumeral ligaments strengthen the anterior facet of the capsule, Coracohumeral ligament strengthens the superior part of the capsule. And again, before we go any further, just a little bit of review. Here's our clavicle up here. Okay. Here is the acromial process or acromion of the scapula. And again, we have that acromioclavicular ligament that is connecting the two. And this is really part of the joint capsule of the acromioclavicular joint or AC joint. These two ligaments right here, here's the trapezoid ligament, which is laterally placed the conoid ligament, which is medially placed, and both of these together comprise the coracoclavicular ligament because they connect the coracoid process, coraco, to the clavicle, clavicular, but they're both part of the same ligament. These three ligaments, remember, combined uh, to collectively stabilize the acromioclavicular joint because they attach from the scapula to the clavicle in some way. In contrast, the coracoacromial ligament is sort of an interscapular ligament, and I put that in quotations, but it basically connects two adjacent parts of the scapula, 
connects the acromial process to the coracoid process. So because this does not attach on the clavicle, the coracoacromial ligament cannot stabilize the AC joint, but it does complete the coracoacromial arch or subacromial arch. So it connects the acromial process to the coracoid process and then provides this little link or this roof right here. And this is the coracoacromial arch. And underneath that is the subacromial space. Okay? And this is a space basically for the head of the humerus to lie in. Okay? And also a space for the uh, tendon of supraspinatus to go through and attach on the greater tubercle. Right? We'll talk about that in more detail later. But that's the coracohumeral ligament, the third intrinsic ligament. Now let's switch gears and talk about some extrinsic ligaments. Okay? Again, we've already talked about this to a great extent, so I'll kind of gloss over this, but this is the coracoacromial ligament. Again, this does not directly stabilize the acromial clavicular joint because it does not attach on the clavicle. It would have to do that in order to contribute to that stabilization. Um, again, I mentioned it was an interscapular ligament because it connects two adjacent parts of the scapula. And the main thing that it does is it helps to complete this coracoacromial arch from the acromial process and then the ligament right here and then to the coracoid process. This arch is really important because it limits the upward translation of the humerus. Okay? If this arch wasn't here and you had a really uh, powerful superior force applied on the humerus, the humerus might actually dislocate out of the joint. Now, you can still have humerus joint dislocations uh, from the scapula, but this arch actually helps to limit or at least minimize the amount of those dislocations. So it actually protects from vertical translations of the humerus. Okay? The other thing is, beneath this coracoacromial arch, we have a subacromial space. And in the subacromial space, we would actually find the tendon of supraspinatus. So kind of right in this area, we would have, at least behind the superior border of the scapula, there'd be the supraspinous fossa for the supraspinatus muscle. The tendon would extend uh, posterior to the coracoid process and extend through the subacromial space to insert on the greater tubercle. So we would find that tendon in the subacromial space. And again, it's formed by the acromion, coracoacromial ligament and the coracoid process. But the coracoacromial ligament is extrinsic, not intrinsic. So now what we're doing is we're looking at a lateral view of the scapula. The humerus has been removed, and this is actually the glenoid fossa. The head of the humerus would actually sit right in here. So here's the glenoid fossa. Surrounding it, this fibrocartilaginous structure, ligament type structure, is the glenoid labrum. And you can see the glenoid labrum wrap around. Remember, its function is to deepen the glenoid fossa. So that way, the humerus has a slightly better fit. The glenohumeral joint's not very stable. Not stable at all, because the head of the humerus is so large in comparison to the small glenoid fossa. So you have to have this glenoid labrum to, to some extent deepen the socket. But also notice it provides an additional attachment for the long head of the biceps brachii tendon. Also, inferiorly at the infraglenoid tubercle down here, the lateral head of the triceps brachii also originates off the glenoid labrum. So hopefully that makes sense. Now a few other things. Here's the acromion, acromial process. Here is the coracoacromial ligament. And then here's the coracoid process, which I probably should have labeled in purple there. But the reason that I wanted to bring that up is because this right here represents the coracoacromial arch. There's the coracoacromial arch. This space uh, between the joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint and the coracoacromial arch, this is the subacromial space. And there's a few things here that we have in the subacromial space. One, there's a subacromial bursa to limit friction, but also we see here supraspinatus. And the tendon of this muscle would extend out of the screen toward you, and it would come at you and insert on the greater tubercle of the humerus if the humerus was actually in here. But this region right here is the subacromial space. Now, because this is the scapula, we can actually see some of the rotator cuff muscles, actually all four. So here at the top in the supraspinous fossa, we have the supraspinatus. On the posterior aspect, we have the larger infraspinatus, and then beneath that, teres minor. Anteriorly, we have subscapularis. And what you'll notice is that there's a space between the subscapularis and the supraspinatus right here, this space right here. 
This space where there's no musculature, this is actually called the rotator interval. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide. But this is the rotator interval. Okay? A few other things here that we can see. One, the coracohumeral ligament right here, which you can actually see is in the rotator interval. We can also see the superior glenohumeral ligament. That is partly also in the rotator interval. There's the middle glenohumeral ligament, which is also partially in that interval, even though it doesn't look like it here. It's in that interval more medially. And then there's the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which notice has two parts. We didn't see that before. It has this anterior band and a posterior band. And the actual nature of this particular ligament uh, is loose. And that's actually what contributes to the formation of this axillary pouch. The fact that you have an anterior and a posterior part of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, and the fact that they uh, attach on each other very loosely creates this slack right here, which is the redundant capsule, but internally is the axillary pouch. And so it allows for some slack. So when you abduct your shoulder and move your arm up or do any kind of movement like that, you're not restricted uh, by the uh, tautness of the joint capsule inferiorly. Hopefully that makes sense. Now let's talk about the rotator interval. So instead of looking at the scapula laterally, now we're back to the original view. So this is an anterior view of the glenohumeral joint. This region right here in the red dotted lines is the rotator interval, as you can see right here. And it basically spans medially from the coracoid process really out to uh, this region right here in the intertubercular groove. Okay, That's really where it spans to. And you'll notice here that above it we have the supraspinatus, at least the muscular part where it's fusing with the tendon right here. So here's the supraspinatus. And beneath that we have the subscapularis muscle. Okay? So there's a region here where there's no muscle. Okay? Now, there are some contents here in the rotator interval. Okay? To some extent we have the biceps brachii long head tendon. So notice here, here's the long head of biceps. Its tendon goes underneath the transverse humeral ligament, but remember it curves over and up. So when it curves over, that part of the tendon is actually located in the rotator interval. We obviously have the coracohumeral ligament. Okay? That actually ran completely between the supraspinatus and subscapularis. And then we have the superior glenohumeral ligament and part of the middle glenohumeral ligament. Um, it's the part of this last ligament that's more medial because remember, as we look at it, as the middle ligament actually goes laterally, it goes inferiorly. So only this part over here would actually be within the rotator interval. And the rotator interval, uh, by nature of the fact that it has these ligaments, uh, it has multiple static stabilizers of the shoulder. Okay, so the coracohumeral ligament and these two ligaments are static stabilizers of the shoulder. It's very important to have integrity of this interval right here because if you lose that integrity, if you have damage here, um, you'll actually lose both anterior and inferior shoulder stability. And if you get damage in this area, uh, it's going to especially affect the shoulder when it's in the adducted or adducted position. Okay? And also what you'll see is that with pathology of the rotator interval, there's going to be external rotation of the shoulder or lateral rotation that's altered. Okay? That's pathologically altered when there's damage to this area. And because there's no muscle in this area, there's muscle above and below but not in this area, that makes this incredibly susceptible to damage. Okay? Um, it's not super common, but it's more common than a lot of other places. And in fact, if you have a condition where uh, the long head of the biceps brachii tendon actually rips off of the supraglenoid tubercle, or at least off the glenoid labrum, we get something called a slap lesion. And maybe in a future video we'll talk more about those. Okay? But make sure that you understand the contents of the rotator interval and what its function is. It has static stabilizers of the shoulder, and if you damage any part of it, you're going to have decreased shoulder stability, in particular in the anterior and inferior directions. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the glenohumeral joint. If you want more detail, um, we had a previous video on this. I'll try to remember to put the link to that in the description. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.